Jeanette Simpson here at Quant Minds International in London. Joining me now is Jackie Chen, Managing Director, Total Portfolio Management at OP Trust and Adjunct Professor at the University of Toronto. Thank you very much for joining me today. Pleasure to be here. So you've been giving a presentation on reinforcement learning application for deep hedging today based on your work at the university. How has using reinforcement learning changed portfolio hedging methodologies and strategies? Yeah, sure. So I will first start with what is uh, reinforcement learning. So reinforcement learning allows the model essentially to understand the environment and take decision uh, multiple steps uh, in, in a sequential basis. So compared to uh, some of the other machine learning approach where, where you only predict what's going to happen one step at a time, the reinforcement learning agents will allow you to consider a whole sequence of uh, decisions, which makes it very helpful for a problem like uh, hedging which you typically have to think about, you know, what's really going to happen over a certain horizon. So this is not the first time we are back here and uh, we're here at Quan Mai presenting this topic. This is about the third or fourth time that we are uh, presenting on this. And every year we bring something different uh, to this topic. And we are very excited about to share our latest approach. So for people who follow this, right, we started with using reinforcement learning that only focusing on the rewards, which means really solely focusing on uh, the money you can make in the hedging or the the, prop, the the cost that you can save in there. And over time, we developed the approach to not only looking at the uh, one point scenario, but the entire possible set of scenarios that can happen in the hedging problem. And what got us excited this year, bringing it back to uh, Quant Mine, is really to our new approach in looking into this with a reinforcement learning algorithm that can also zoom into the adverse scenarios that typically rare but very impactful for portfolio managers to manage their portfolios and we have demonstrated that by being able to model that part of the outcome better uh, you actually have more robust uh, robust uh, hedging um, results uh, overall compared to uh, the methods that we had previously introduced to the audience and what are the challenges in implementing reinforcement learning models for deep hedging in real world financial markets well first of all I think there's already evidence out there that some of the financial institutions are already using it. And you particularly see those areas where you have a lot of data. And unfortunately, not in every single financial problem, you're able to collect that amount of uh, that large amount of data. So data sometimes is still a constraint for uh, reinforcement learning because it's uh, really data hungry. Uh, the model itself actually needs to take many iterations to interact with the environment in order to uh, learn the best decisions and without a lot of data it's difficult to train a good model. The second part of it is really the computational power because uh, I think unfortunately uh, machine learning is really uh, computational heavy uh, in most of those right including some of these gen AI models that we talk about also in this conference and reinforcement learning is just like them and that requires a lot of you know infrastructure building for organizations that are committed to this technologies and, and they have to have a robust pe platform and computational power in order to support this model. And in your research, you also study the application of machine learning techniques for derivatives pricing and risk management. How are these techniques influencing the future of these practices? So I can think about it in two different applications that we look in um, from our research at Rotman School of Management. Mm -hmm. and. One area is really from a risk management perspective, we do know that using machine learning can certainly help you to predict risk and in this case the volatility of the asset returns uh, better because it's able to capture the nonlinear uh, patterns that uh, sometimes for a distribution that is not well behaved is actually a good way of using it. So, so that certainly improved the forecasting for um, a lot of the financial institutions. Second, on the derivative pricing problem that we just talked about, oftentimes, especially in some of the more exotic or complicated financial products, uh, historically it takes institution quite a bit of effort to provide a good pricing on it and typically involves something called the Monte Carlo simulations where you have to use machine to simulate a bunch of scenarios and determine what is a fair value of that uh, particular products. And what machine learning can now do is essentially uh, with an upfront investment of generating a lot of the scenarios, a lot of these pairs of uh, possible outcomes um, and what are the products uh, that you would like to price, you're actually able to build machine learning model to connect them. Despite it takes a longer time to set this up, once it's set up, it's much faster, uh, a bit, uh, much, much faster way to price the uh, products. So that is another area that we see uh, some of the 
uh, financial institutions have already implemented or started to explore this type of pricing uh, models in uh, using machine learning in order to speed up that process so that they can also you know serve their clients better. And how do you go about balancing traditional and machine learning approaches? I think this is a very interesting question because more and more we see less and less people draw a line between what's you know more a tradition, traditional statistical approach versus a machine learning approach and I think part of it is really uh, the school education these days already equip a lot of the, the younger graduates with, with that sort of learning and they don't no, no longer try to draw a line say what's tradition what um, machine learning and what I meant by this is if you really take a step back and think about some of this traditional approach, right, re, uh, just as simple as linear regression, some people can say I can solve it with a machine learning way, essentially allowing the machine to do a trial and error to fit the model as opposed to go with the statistical definition of solving that. So I do see it is being more and more very in terms of, you know, some of this more classical uh, machine learning approach. And when you talk about more of the sophisticated one that like the deep learning, which is something that power the reinforced learning, I think in, in practice, the key there is really to allow us to understand how these models actually behave. So there's an entire uh, set of work that has to be done for, for stakeholders to, to gain the comfort in there. Uh, there. And I think the, the progress in the large language model really helped us to, to move that forward because now people can understand that, you know, powered by this deep learning technology or deep learning techniques, not even just, you know, in the prediction side, you can do better, but language you can do better. And somehow, I think that really certainly helped um, some of the stakeholder to feel more comfortable in, uh, in, in using some of this more sophisticated approach. And also maybe in, in some ways also asking, making a lot of people asking the questions, right? If I don't have these sort of tools in my toolbox, am I going to fall behind the competition? So I think, I think in general, the, the, the more deeper uh, like the the more uh, sophisticated approach, I think we still see some uh, time for it to be deeply embedded in a lot of the uh, problems. But then for more of the classical machine learning, I think is we are pretty much there because uh, the younger generations is very capable of using it and, and making that as part of the analysis. Always a balance. Yeah. Jackie Chen, thank you very much for joining me. Thank you.